Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 1 million high quality video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 25% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code FRAMERATE1113. A pair of legs engineered to defy the laws of physics and a mindset to master the most epic of splits. <laughs> Enya. I know. I ain't, uh, too much Enya. Go, go, go. Welcome to episode 149 of the revolution known as Frame Rate, the show that wants to help you watch what you want, when you want, where you want it, and give you the devices, tools, and knowledge to make it happen. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, man, and that was Enya featuring Jean-Claude Van Damme's legs. <laughs> the best part about that split video is obviously Jean-Claude Van Damme splitting his legs between two moving semis, but the Enya just kind of, what a, I don't know if it's comic or appropriate it, or just it, it just makes me laugh every time i hear just it. the right amount of over the top yeah. look there's a chemistry that made this thing explode to 24 million views in less than 72 hours and for those of you who haven't seen it just type in epic split uh a volvo jcvd or whatever you'll find it this thing it's already up to 27 million views pardon me uh what's clever about it is that it's it's short it doesn't overstay its welcome it is Jean-Claude Van Damme meditating. The camera pulls back and you see that he's standing on the rear view mirrors of two backwards moving semis. Now, first of all, there's like, you know, pe people who drive big rigs, like they, they could do this kind of thing if they're highly skilled. But in this case, it is exquisitely precise because the two start to pull apart. And of course, JCVD goes in this perfect split. And, uh, and of course, it looks fake as hell. You look at this thing and they're like, this is CGI'd all the yep. heck. And then uh, in the end, it says, by the way, this is an ad to show you how precise uh, the Volvo steering advanced system of whatever is. And then and then the first thing you do is you type in Google, like, is this real? Wall Street Journal talks how they created it. Apparently, everything is exactly as you saw it. It, it was all done in one take. It's, the only thing they don't see is that he's wearing a harness for safety. And they, they you know, and, and that part, and they built like, they well, built duh. a wooden platform on the rearview mirror so they would have a little more surface area. That's that's the only thing even close to a cheat. Uh, uh, yes. And, and I wouldn't even call that a cheat. I, I'll tell you, it's in the contest between who I respect the most in that video. It's the two drivers who, who yeah. are just driving They're, backwards. I didn't realize oh, they were going amazing. backwards at first. It, it, oh that kind of just strikes you. And suddenly you're like, wait a minute, the lines on the road are going, oh my gosh, they're going backwards. Well, and what's uh, funny is when you see it, you're like, at first you're like, oh, he's moving really slow, backwards, backwards on two 18 wait, wheelers. Wait, wait, I can't wait, back up a trailer. Wait. <laughs> well, uh, hey, that's enough Jean-Claude Van Damme. Actually, no, there's never enough Jean-Claude Van Damme. It's all we can handle right now because we have to bring in our guest. John Hess, managing editor of FilmmakerIQ.com, is joining us today. Hello. Welcome to the show, Hi. John. Thanks for joining us, man. How are you doing? Oh, I, I love that Van, Cl Van Damme clip. Let's just watch more of that. It's the whole show. Just, <laughs> really, if we were sports. smart, we would just replay that. Until the end of the show. And we would probably for those of you guys uh, at home who don't know, we have played several times on Frame Rate little snippets of uh, his Filmmaker IQ series. This is, uh, the, I think the first one we saw, or I know I tweeted it out, was the uh, the history of aspect ratios. Is that the, that, oh, yeah. was that one of your first biggest hits? Or what's, which that is was, your most popular of that series? Uh, that was probably the first biggest hit. Then we had the um, green screen, history of green screen. We talked about the history of, of chroma key and, well, Chroma key is more of a modern term, but the history of how they replaced backgrounds from back to the matte days to the, the black and white you also um, processes. Ex you also explain, but, and forgive me, I've forgotten, what's the, the effect that was used at the end of 2001, the, uh, the cinema effect to make that that's happen? It's called slit scan. It's a slit scan okay. effect created by Douglas Trumbull. It's a really interesting effect. Um, it's, uh, you want me to explain that? It's kind of a, it's, you get a little more complicated. They take a single slit 
and they run transparency behind that slit, and they have a camera that basically dollies out and it creates this big giant smear, and then they do that over and over and over again, and they did it so, for months. What what I loved about all of his presentations, and just uh, I guess what's the best way to find? Just to go to filmmakeriq.com or filmmakeriq.com. They're all there, right on the front page. You can see all the all of our videos right there. They are exquisitely crafted. They're beautiful to watch. The pacing is amazing. You have, a, you have a real knack for telling an engaging story about the emergence of Hollywood and the reasons for the special effects that we all know and love. Well, thank you. I think it's important for people to understand these days that we don't live in a vacuum, that we have a huge history of, of film and entertainment behind us, and that people that in the past were just as creative and just as inju uh, and ingen ah, I'm losing myself, as ingenious <laughs> as we are nowadays. I mean, it's there, when you look at the history and you kind of study, because I had to spend a lot of time researching these, you're just kind of overwhelmed by how much history is behind us and kind of and where we are today. <laughs> You know, film is only 110 years old, so we got a lot, lot, lot more to go. A lot, lot just more to getting go. started. Just getting oh, started. Just, exactly. It's incredible. Well, we're very happy to have you and your Thank brain you. with us today. Let's get right into the big story. This just in the big story. Now, now we're probably not making the best impression on, on you uh, here, John. Uh, we're going to start with a bill from the Senate called the Consumer Choice and Online Video Act. But trust me, it's going to get better from there. Uh, this, this is, uh, okay. this is like by... the John claude Van Damme moment. Right now, it's just a close-up of our stupid faces. Right, Soon, right. both of our legs will be splayed out between airplanes. It's going to be Literally. awesome. Well, maybe you have to realize, I did, a, I did a video on the, whole, on the history of horror, and I talked about the German Deutschmark. So oh, perfect. You're, don't you're worry about it. it. <laughs> I'm totally uh, cool with it. U.S. Senator Jay Rockefeller has uh, submitted a 63-page bill, which... There's a lot of detail here. In fact, I would recommend reading John Brodkin's article in Ars Technica if you want to get a good, good, it's a summary, but it's a long summary of all the things this thing does. Particular to us and the cord cutters in our audience and the, the wannabe cord cutters and the maybe someday cord cutters uh, are the provisions that say that, A, they're going to make it the law, not an FCC regulation, but the law that no online uh, internet service provider can degrade or affect any other video provider uh, if they provide video. Saying like, look, it's, it's not a net neutrality bill. It's just saying particularly about video that if you're an ISP and you provide video, you can't degrade somebody else's video. All right, and then and specifically, e now, uh, now they, they actually did a turnaround because when I first read that, the first thing I thought was like, whenever you get a, wall, a, a law, you get weaselly actions. And I'm thinking, okay, fine. No, sir, we're not slowing down their video. We're just offering our premium video. But there's later language that specifically says if it creates the same effect of favoring one over the other. So, so it, they, they did kind of think ahead to the kind of crap that cable operators often do. Yeah, it even goes into peering agreements and all that sort of thing. But the other thing is uh, it would make it, uh, it would encourage you to negotiate. It would basically say you have to negotiate with everybody who wants to carry your video if you make it available. So no more like, well, I run a broadcast cable network and I'll make my, I'll negotiate with every cable television provider out there because I have to. This would say, yeah, guess what? If they're a, a, a television provider over the internet, doesn't matter that it's going over a different kind of cable, an Ethernet cable or a fiber optic cable. They're a cable provider. You have to negotiate with them too. No more blocking out people who want to provide online only cable television service. So my favorite part of this story was the little thing they slipped in at the end where it's like, oh, also people should have access to over the air antennas, whether it's in person or rented yeah, over in other any words, distribution it method whatsoever, including we're make IP. Area legal. We're just yes. gonna we're not going to wait for the Supreme <laughs> Court. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, how much of this have you been following, John? Are, is this something that that you that you care about? Do you worry about um, the, the net neutrality? Do you think that making a law is an effective solution to to give a level playing field? Well, net neutrality is one of those things that's it's, it's really a complicated discussion. And it it's goes way beyond my understanding of technology involved behind it. Um, but, you know, you have to be careful when you try to run anything through Congress regarding the net because the net moves so quickly. And what we have in, in, in government takes forever to get going. Like, I, I'm sure there's going to be a way around this. Somebody will figure out, even if the law does pass, something's going to happen where someone's going to figure out a way to screw up other people's videos or 
I mean, there's got, there's got to be ways around it. So I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I guess I guess you would know, being a historian of Hollywood, that that's the whole reason Hollywood became the place to make movies, so, yeah. so that they could run down to Mexico and evade uh, patent law to begin with, right? Of course. I mean, there's there's always a way. There's that's the you can change the rules of the game, but the game never changes. So. I think of it as, as sort of there's a circle of nefarious behavior around a central point that is where we're supposed to be. And everybody's always trying to figure out ways around it. And this is this bill, which, by the way, I don't think has a chance in hell of passing. But I were agree. it to, by some miracle, actually make it through and become law, would just move that point over here. And, yeah, people would be getting around it, and they'd come up with all their slippery ways. But it would say, you know what, right now they can just say, no, we're not going to negotiate with anybody. By Bay saying, now you have to negotiate, sure, it might not guarantee that we get the same level of service, but the playing field is now over in that area instead of just not being a playing field altogether. Exactly. You don't the want equivalent. To, oh, go uh, ahead. Oh, I said you don't want to, I mean, it's not a total throw up your hands in the air and say, well, you know, we can't do anything about it. So it's at least it is it's something that moving in the right direction. It's I don't have the, the technical knowledge to tell you if that's the proper way to do it or not. Well, but I, I'll tell you what, I do have the social knowledge to say this is the equivalent of making it a law that you all have to be fair from now on. All right, that's the law. Just everyone be cool, all right? Pass. Nah, I don't, I don't know. I, I know what you're saying. I think, it's, I think it's more nuanced than that. I do think some of the parts of this bill are just not necessary and the wrong way to go about it, saying like, oh, don't degrade video and don't prioritize your own video. I love the idea, but this is the wrong way to go about it because it solves a tiny part of the problem instead of dealing with the big problem, which is the marketplace for internet service in this country and the marketplace for video service in this country. So I think it could be better written. Uh, but yeah, I, it's it's all sort of moot because it's probably not going to have any chance. I agree. You know what's back. not moot is another, another big story. Big story, yeah. 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 You read my mind. I did. Actually, I read the book. Just Stop right. everything. It's another big story. A uh, couple of interesting stories. Peter Kafka over at All Things D uh, looked at the subscriber numbers for the recent quarter for the uh, the big the big guys in the pay TV business. Then Craig Moffat analyzed them. Uh, they're bad. They're, they're declined again for the third straight quarter. But there's a lot of spin going on there out there. A lot of people are saying, well, the housing market's recovering, so you can't blame the economy anymore. But Moffitt, Craig Moffat points out, and Kafka point, passes this along, that even though housing market is still going well, occupied housing declined in the third quarter. And you got to have somebody in the house for them to subscribe to cable. And the fact that most of the cable decline was offset by an increase in satellite uh, subscribers, Dish and DirecTV particularly, uh, means that this probably isn't as bad for pay TV as maybe it would be. However, the fact of the matter is it's declining. And then you see this other uh, Stacey Higginbotham story over at GigaOM, which points out a, uh, a study from another analyst uh, who, who looked at over-the-top viewing habits. They did a survey, 12-month uh, survey, and found that consumers are increasing their use of over-the-top broadband TV sources, even if they keep cable. So increased significantly the number of net-connected TV use was 24%. More than half the consumers surveyed with a connected TV have increased their over-the-top broadband. So my question to you guys is, all right, we've got a little bit of decline, a little bit of a saggy pay TV market. And all these people are out there using their Netflix boxes and their Amazon Instant and their Xboxes and their PS4s. Are we headed for a situation where the cable companies keep propping things up by giving you better deals, by letting you like keep your cable service even though you wanted to cancel it, just get, just pay for internet? Are we headed for just a big womp of a decline where all of a sudden all these people who realize, you know, I'm only ever watching Netflix and Hulu anymore. I think I'm just going to cancel the cable TV part of this. Well, you know my answer in advance, so I'm going to let John take this one first. What, what, what's your read on this, John? Okay, well, I've got friends, obviously, who've dropped their cable. I'm still on cable. I probably should drop it because I hardly ever watch it. Um, you know, the thing is, there we, we are kind of in a, are in a little bubble of technically capable people, but people like my mom, who mom who can't operate her the remote control, they kind of need that that simplicity of cable. So, I think there's always going to be that level, that plateau. But we're, we're definitely in a decline right now as far as subscribership. So I don't I think look, these numbers show anything different. Yeah, I look at these numbers that of the of the increased usage 
of, of internet TV boxes and internet TV sources. And I think about my own situation where we still have direct TV in the house. Uh, I'm, I'm the, I'm the correspondent for that, that side of things with frame rate is like, I've got, I've got the internet boxes, but I've also still got the old fashioned thing. And I find myself using it less and less. And I find myself hoping what I want to watch is not available on direct TV. So I can find it in a, a more easy to use situation. Using it on so, an Apple TV or a Roku is just a better experience because I don't have to program a DVR and then record it and then remember to go back and fast forward through commercials. It's a hassle. And I think a lot of people are going to get to this point where suddenly they realize, gosh, you know what? It's a better experience. I enjoy watching things on demand. Alpha House is my favorite new show or Orange is the New Black is my favorite new show and it's not even on TV. Maybe I don't need that cable box anymore. It just, it just they eliminate it through disuse rather than you know, I want to cut the cord as some kind of I'm stepping forward so, to do it. It just kind of happens naturally. Here's here's why this might be the best possible situation for fans of frame rate. The fact that you have uh, two stories. And first of all, anytime, you know, the, the, the cable company is saying, well, there may be more houses, but there are people not in it. One word, my friend, what a math. You can only spin this so far. The fact is you've got this uh, here. I'm going to put this chart right in your face. Look at that chart of year over year growth. Which uh, you know declined, and I love I love seeing that like frame rate started right around here, right the last <laughs> time that there was an increase in you know, and then it's just all negative and people lost, losing cable from there. But the good news is is that the increase in the over the top services means that uh, that it it means that it's bad for for people who try to control the pipe. But at the same time, there's an extraordinarily strong signal that we're watching more video than ever. And we expect more content than ever and better quality content than ever. Because if you only had the one half of cables dying, well, then folks who make content that's distributed on cable would probably be panicking. But instead, by seeing that, that no, you know, there's this, this movement or maybe in, maybe the pie gets bigger for all of us, just not so much for cable. Uh, it's, it's good because it keeps, it's clear that we are entering an even more healthy environment for content creators uh, while also pleasing consumers like me who uh, are, are sick and tired of, of, you know, the restrictive nature of cable television. A question also, too, yeah, is John, what happens, what about live events? I mean, there's always, I, maybe you guys can speak better because I haven't been following as much, but can you watch the Super Bowl on the internet? Can you watch your favorite NFL games on the internet? Yeah. Is, well, what's, yes. what, what's funny is, is there, you know, we do cover those when they come. That's, that's where the hot new developing space is. You know, the Olympics appearing on the internet was a big deal. That's right. Um, you, you got the Super Bowl on the internet, but <laughs> you would have, a, you'd watch the Super Bowl and then it would go to ads and you would watch the same super cheap CPM, you know, uh, regular ads that you get from YouTube or whatever, <laughs> instead of the legendary uh, Super Bowl ads. So we're very much in an emerging space. And you're right mm -hmm. to identify that that's the last part of the puzzle because we know for offline content we, that, that we all prefer being able to binge watch. We like being able to find it. We like recommendation engines. Uh, but live is going to be what needs to be figured out, especially for sports, if we're going to make the transition completely away from I, cable. Honestly, I, I, think live, I think live is in the same position as broadcast, right? Broadcast is saying, we have all the great shows and we're going we're gonna to make it harder for you to watch them online so that you'll want to keep the cable subscriptions. And what happened? Netflix says, well, we're going to start making great shows then. Uh, and live is going to be doing the same thing. Yeah, you can watch the Super Bowl live because CBS does that as a stunt because they don't think it's going to undermine their ratings. They think it's, it can only help. But other things like the Oscars are not streamed online. Uh, you have to find right. a pirate station for that. But other live events that maybe the broadcasters missed are being not created, but but happening. Sometimes they're being created. Uh, One Direction Day is being created coming up this Saturday, which probably isn't as big a deal for us as it might be for some younger <laughs> members of the world. Uh, but then there's, you know, there's the guy jumping out of the edge of space to the ground. That's and that was live on YouTube, right? That's the, yeah. There's lots of live things happening. So we're getting a little competition for like, well, what are the bigger live events and, and how are they delivered and how are they consumed? Let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor for today's episode of Frame Rate, Shutterstock.com. Brian Brushwood, did you know that Shutterstock brings you the perfect image or video for your next creative project? Did you know that? Yeah. Well, how, did, how could you possibly know that? Because I hadn't told you that yet. Uh, well, I'll tell you how I know is because I went to Shutterstock and poked around. I was looking for what? a gorilla. And well, so wait a minute. Went, you can't. You can't. Can you just went to Shutterstock and poke around? Didn't you? You didn't buy the service? 
No, no, you just make an account for free. You poke around. Look, go to Shutterstock right now. Hey, Jason, hmm. show this man. You're supposed to be telling me about Shutterstock. Come on, man. You're talking well, to the Shutterstock I mean, mastery. My, my nickname in college was Shutterstocky. They, they were like, what's up, Stocky? I was like, it's Shutterstocky. Gorilla. Type in gorilla. What kind of gorilla you want? You want pictures of gorilla? You want gorilla sounds? I don't know I if they have sounds. Do they have sounds? Is what angry gorillas. They got yeah. photos? The, the, sure. Okay. Gorilla, you show Videos? me gorilla. I mean, that's a search engine. But can this search engine sh search by emotion? That's uh, what I I'll want. I'll tell you what. No, no, no. Try this. Change gorilla to gorilla. G-U-E-R. <laughs> like like the, the the warriors. Right? Angry gorilla. How you like that trick? There we go. Is that going to work? It's typing it in. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm sure there'll be an angry. We're going to find it. Well, you put a slash in there. There we go. Without the slash, hit it again. Oh, I sad gorilla. <laughs> I think you pushed it too far, Brian. Oh, yep. Yeah. No, I did. We got gorillas. No kidding. Look at oh, They're shooting look at that. stuff. Huh. They're having a war right in front of you. You can make a war movie and you, you don't even totally have to You can totally make a war, war movie out of those gorilla food. That's amazing. Here, I Shutterstock has surprised me once again with their 12,000 video clips a week, uh, their 2D or 3D animation, their motion graphics. You can choose from individual clips or video packs. Essentially, if you're making something and you think, gosh, I wish I had gorilla clips of any kind of gorilla or a skyline or a spider or a bird flying, go to Shutterstock. You're not going to only find it, but you're going to find it easily with a great search engine. And you're going to find what you need with a price that fits your plan. They have flexible pricing, either individual clips or video packs, HD or standard definition or web format, whatever you need. What you don't need is to give them a credit card. Uh, just start an account, begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your next project could be like. Save some video click selections to your clip box so you find just the ones that you want to choose between. And once you decide to purchase, use offer code FRAMERATE1113 and new accounts will receive 25% off. That's a quarter off. Not 25 cents, 25% 25 off any package. That's Shutterstock.com. <laughs> and for 25% off new accounts, use that offer code frame rate. Here, save, save 25 cents. <laughs> Play some Galaga, kid. You know, you said, yeah, Sawyer's like, no, that's not right. It's, that is not the way it goes. It's like, get, do the do the ad right. He's a big fan of Shutterstock. He doesn't like it. This, this footage, he's the official Shutterstock mascot. He's going to be barking his support. I'm sure you we can do find him somewhere in there. For their support of frame rate. All right, let's fire up the slipstream. Here's your fire up the slipstream. Release the slipstream. Open the slipstream gates. Hey, is this going to make you mad? Brian Hulu wants to partner with pay TV operators, according to a report on CNET. Um, okay, here's the thing. I was thinking about this because structurally, this is the exact same story same that we story already heard Netflix, right. with yeah. Netflix, right? And, yet, and it's just I don't rumored. Want... It's not an announcement. So it's, it's just pretty yeah, much yeah. the same story, yeah. But, uh, and, and then I'll tell you what, I picture Hulu on a cable box and I picture... Hulu, uh, I picture pe people paying their cable company for a Hulu service, you know, nine ninety five a month or whatever. And um, I don't know if it's that I'm just so not threatened or I'm just so not a fan of Hulu Plus or I just I don't, still don't understand what Hulu is. That I'm like, good riddance. Get, get, have them. <laughs> so, <laughs> have so, them so really, your, your opinion's ads. the same. It's just that you care yeah. less about the company in question. Yeah, yeah, because I feel like I feel like Hulu Plus is not such a great and and again I've not used it. Maybe somebody can convince me what's so great about it. But the fact you know, and I'm I'm with you. You have actually convinced me on this, Tom. That you know, paying yeah. a service and then also sitting through ads is like I'm not a fan of doing both, especially when your only privilege is to watch content that was already for free that it, that you could have DVR. It's like I don't know. Uh, it's it's like it's like a worse version of Aereo. Uh, the, uh, uh, but anyway, I don't know. I think that's what it is, is I, is I resent the service and I don't feel threatened by it going to cable. John, do you, the idea here, the, there's been a story about Netflix in the same sort of talks is that Hulu would talk to like Time Warner Cable, Cox Communications, et cetera, and be installed on one of their set top boxes from the cable companies. And then you, if you wanted to subscribe to Hulu plus it would be added to your bill. I haven't been following, honestly, the Hulu situation, and I don't use Hulu. I'm, Brian makes a really good point. I'm I'm actually just a Netflix user, and I've never seen a reason to stray from that. So, well, Hulu maybe maybe John could chime in on the debate because uh, the, part of the reason that this is an interesting story is that John, uh, uh, Tom, and I got like really fired up in an argument about what if Netflix had gone uh, showed up as a cable box service that you could pay ten dollars, and this is theoretical and un unconfirmed. But imagine you could, along with HBO, you could pay ten dollars and get Netflix on your cable box. 
uh, and you would have the Netflix experience, but it would be part of your cable package. Um, you know, Tom felt like that's great because we would be giving a little bit of the drug to people to lure them out of the ecosystem. I thought it was terrible because you were building a, a you know, a pair of golden handcuffs where it's like, look, you don't need to leave us. You got the Netflix now. Um, like, like, uh, does it change anything if you picture it as a Netflix thing, which you know and love? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I think that maybe the, they have to look at it. Does Netflix have anything to gain from that? Um, Netflix was a different situation. Well, that's all. But Hulu is, you know, it's much smaller than I, I imagine than Netflix is. Um, yes. But how, is. how much Netflix, I think, wants to be its own studio. Well, it is its own studio. It wants to be its own thing. I don't think they would want to be tied to something like, like a cable subscribership like that, like you, like you just described. So um, I, I don't think that would people work. spending nine dollars a month, they'll, they won't mind. Well, do they, but do they already spend nine bucks a month? Are those well, I think new, what they're new trying news? to do, the, the idea is they're trying to reach the people who aren't buying Netflix because they don't buy a Roku. They're, they're, they're like your mom that you were talking about earlier. They don't really understand any of that. But if it was already on their cable box and it was just in the normal set of options when they're going through the menu on the guide, then maybe they would. Well, that's actually, you know, as you put it that way, that's actually, that actually makes sense from, from that point, Spec. But I, I don't. I don't know. I have to think about that some more. That's, a, that's an interesting perspective, Tom. But, but the, mere, the mere fact that you don't have any kind of gut discuss, you know, because that's what was so curious when we had our little debate was that we both instantly went to different corners. But the fact that you're sort of ambivalent uh, is is kind of another point to to concern all together. Uh, what's this next story over here, Tom? Well, Brian, I'm glad you transitioned me to the next story so that I could tell you about Netflix's brand new look. <laughs> Which is more pictures, really. The, the only way I've experienced this so far <laughs> is on the PS4. Uh, the PS4 comes with the new look, but it's not, uh, it hasn't showed up on my Roku for some reason. And apparently it's coming to, and it's not coming to things like the Apple TV or the Xbox 360. Um, so I don't know. What do you, have you, have you guys looked at this? Have you experienced it I, in I, real I, life? I read I haven't experienced in real life, but the article does say that they are very pleased with it and they plan to roll it out everywhere specifically because it has a lot more pictures. And, it's, and number one, like Netflix from a, has has identified their sort of branding problem where they they have this stink of like, well, there's not much to watch on Netflix or it's old stuff that we don't care about or whatever. And so by highlighting what it is you're choosing, but in the background, just constantly having just just all this other stuff you've heard of and that, you know, is cool, they they could sort of underlie that message that is like, no, man, we got a lot of crap. And plus, uh, you know, doing stuff like uh, like automatically playing, like you'll notice what, what Netflix is very, very cleverly doing is getting closer and closer to a video Pandora where you start watching something that you like. You're like, I like this. And then you just run through that show. And then without even asking you, it just goes on. It's like, ah, you like Archer. You're going to like Bob's Burgers. Let me just start that up for you. Turn it off if you want. And then it goes through that. Um, I None think of my Netflix apps smart. actually start the next one. Which one of yours actually like just starts a, a totally different when, series? When you, when, you watch on, when you watch on web, on, on web, uh, uh, like, like a, just, I'm okay. almost yeah. certain it, it started uh -huh. up the next series for yeah, me. Yeah, I never watched it on the web, I, so that's why I've seen yeah. that. Interesting. It's I know that's what the they're going to get to. Yeah, it starts with the next episode. I've noticed that. And it's incredibly bad for if you, if, you know, you sit down like, I want to watch one show and you end up watching 30. So, <laughs> That's you know. Nice. But it's good if, if you have the kind of job that requires uh, use of the symbolic parts of your brain, but leaves the language parts free. It's very easy to get work done uh, and, and have it open to the side. For example, I've been working on some tax stuff where all I have to do is literally move colored blocks to the right columns. And I'm just thinking of your know, cut, paste, cut, paste. Uh, my brother does 3D modeling and animation where he's just like, you know, inverse kinematics, you know, move, move this bone structure, whatever. And it's easy. And for that, man, Netflix is amazing. Just turn it on and let it run like a TV in the background. Yeah, but right, whatever, move on. Every, oh, go ahead, John. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was saying every time I turn something on the background, it I completely zone it out. I ne <laughs> I'm, It's gone. So, yeah, let's move on to the tube tops. Roku's uh, just dead channels over the past week like crazy. Uh, they, they've made a partnership with ESPN and Disney Channel. If you remember, Apple TV recently got those as well. Same deal. You have to authenticate that you already subscribed to the channels in question on the proper provider. So even if you do subscribe and you're on the wrong provider, it's not going to work. But if you do, you'll be able to watch ESPN Live 
and the Disney Channel stuff on your Roku. They also have an AOL News channel, part of AOL On, uh, that's trying to bring you more actual local and live news coverage to the Roku. And the biggest one today, Sling Media, uh, just launched a Roku channel so that if you have a Sling box that's streaming your television, you could watch it on a Roku, maybe in another room, maybe you're traveling, you take the Roku with you, you can watch your Sling box over it. It's a little weird, though, because you have to use your phone, either your iPhone or your Android phone, to get the channel to work at all. You can't just log now, in on the Roku. So, okay, now that might be a way to authenticate, because it might be that you could, you, can you use anybody's Roku? Because that would make sense then. Like, if, if it's not even tied to your specific Roku, and you could, you know, like I go to your place and my Sling's running, and and it's like, oh, you're going to miss it. And then it's like, obviously, if I were to try to hop onto your Roku, you have the HBO Go problem where it's like, well, how many people you're going to have watching this, Brian? Who you giving your code out to everyone? But instead, if you have a device oh, that's Slingbox, definitely tied. Though. It's Slingbox. Only yeah. one, one account. Oh, that's right. Only one per time. time. Never mind. And there's no, that there's no service provider. It's you. It's it's your, your Slingbox at your house. It does make it logging in a little easier in that situation. Though. I'll give you that. So you don't have to yeah, go maybe. like, well, let me log you out and log me back in. I can just, you know, sling my my video right from the phone. I just found it confusing when I fire up the channel for the first time and it's like, open your iPhone. And of course, like an idiot, I open my iPad and it doesn't work, or at least I didn't see it. I think it might work because when I open my iPhone, I'm like, okay, what do I do here? And then I figured it out. There's a little like box with an arrow flying out of it that I'm like, oh, I guess I hit that and it sends it to the Roku. And I did. And Roku came up because it saw it on the network and it, and it worked seamlessly then, but it was a little confusing right off the top. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you, man. This is, this is that brief moment when we feel like our grandpa where you're like, I don't know. I was pressing the buttons and it's not well, working. No, but it doesn't, it, but no, 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 no. It doesn't tell you anything. That's my point here is not that I was necessarily like confused grandpa it was that it said open your phone and then you open your phone and there's nothing there it's just your normal slingbox app you had Got to it. know to press that little button and then it's like oh, okay they didn't give you any help text or anything to guide you along john you use a roku by any chance no i but i the sounds like i need to <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what do you usually watch if you're not if you're not watching netflix on your desktop computer with the web interface is there another device you use do you use like a game station or anything no i just have an i have a i have a media center how's that i mean that's ancient technology right with windows Heck media yeah. center from from Proper. Uh, no that's that's Vista. the top of the line experience that's what we yes. that's what i recommend to anyone if you want the best living room uh, cable cutting experience is freaking yes absolutely use a use a real pc yeah, but it is it is Windows Vista and and the Netflix on the Windows Media Center is ancient and it is I, I mean I go to the web to watch Netflix because it's so so yeah. ratty and old, but oh well. Thing is, yeah. the future future generations have no excuse to be bored ever again. No, but they'll find they'll find a way. They'll find a way. I'm very excited though because I only have one Direct TV box, and what this does, Western Digital TV had a Slingbox app already, but it was really bad, really clunky, and really laggy. This one works a lot better. So now in the bedroom, and actually downstairs, they have two other Roku's. Although one of the Roku's is original, and it's not going to work on the original. It only works on the Roku twos and threes. Uh, but in, in, I, I can extend my watching to the other room just over Slingbox. I think that's pretty cool. Let's move on to film fact. <laughs> Brian, Netflix did it again. They saved what? a life. Well, okay, you say saved a life. I say they're practicing witchcraft and voodoo because it's not a case where something was clinging on desperately. Something was dead and brought back to life. And I don't trust no. I don't trust nothing brought back from the dead. They That's, saved a life with witchcraft and voodoo. <laughs> that way we both win. Uh, and okay. we're both right. AMC canceled the killing. Twice, by the way. So it's a, it definitely is a zombie television show. You just can't keep this thing dead. Uh, but Netflix has said, hey, we'll bring it back. We'll give you six episodes for a fourth season. It is being billed as the final season, though, Brian. Do you believe them this time? Uh, sure, as much as I believed Futurama. <laughs> <laughs> I believe Futurama this time, sadly. I don't think they will. I, come I don't even know that I believe them this time. <laughs> really? I don't know. I could see a I could see a one off special down the road. A Christmas special comes out of nowhere five years from now. I could totally see that. I didn't watch The Killing. Did you guys watch The Killing? I, I did not. I did not. And go back and catch up on so. it now that I know it's dead, or will be dead. 
But fans <laughs> they, of the killing will be living again. <laughs> be excited. You're gonna get six more episodes. All right. Please pardon the dated big song of the summer themed intro. It's time for scan lines. Yeah. This is Scanlines, where we have 60 seconds to talk about six stories that are also of importance to you as a person who likes to watch what you want, when you want, where you want. Brian, you want to lead off or shall I? Actually, uh, you go first. Yeah, let me go first. I think that makes sense. I, I, I think we're on the same page here. All right, start the clock. The NFL and the Major League Baseball have filed briefs with the Supreme Court regarding a request for the Supreme Court to rule on the Aereo decision because the NFL and MLB say, look, if Aereo is declared legal, we are going to move all of our broadcasts off of over the air and on to cable. Those two or three broadcasts we have left, by golly, we're moving them to cable, Brian. Yeah, uh, this, uh, good. That's the response of America to this. And and should be, that's, NFL and MLB should be praying that that Ariel goes in so that they have this excuse, this, this credible threat to leave broadcast where they can make their own channel, where they can make their own apps, where they can do their own pay-per-view. They'll make much more money this way and everyone will still see it. John, does this scare you at all? No, sounds like a good idea. You watch a lot of sports though? <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, see, yeah, I watch bowling. I do watch a lot of bowling. That's what I used to. That's good enough for me. So. Yeah, I, I, think <laughs> All right. I think that tells it right there. NFL, MLB want to support the broadcasters and their threats. Oh, man. Uh, hey, man, you know what I would watch is more MLG. That's Major League Gaming on its own premium platform for streaming esports, uh, MLG.tv. Sounds to me like uh, this is what, like a like an alternative to Twitch.tv or it's another presence on the, no, this the is, esports this is market? ESPN circa 1982 for gaming sports. I watched it. I launched it. I'm like, it's a total ripoff of Sports Center. They've even got the little thing down the side that says what stories they're going to be talking about. They do leaderboards. They did top five plays of the week. I was getting ready to mock it until I was 45 minutes later still watching it, Brian. Oh, yeah. You know what? I have seen some of this stuff. Uh, I, I don't know if I saw some test programming on another network or whatever, but it's extraordinary. They have Click on the, the eSports Report everything. tab, Jason. Uh, you know what? And I'm going to use an extension on this because this is fascinating. You know that I am obsessed with the idea of uh, the, the of, of this discovery. Like, like for 30 years, people sat on the couch watching their bros play these games. And then all of a sudden, somebody says, uh, hey, why don't we make programming out of that? And uh, and everyone's shocked, like it's the most amazing thing ever. Uh, here's the thing. The only thing missing from this uh, to be as ubiquitous and as big as uh, as, you know, major league sports are traditional sports is the context for everybody to understand how the games work and why they should care. And that's going to happen automatically. People, uh, teenagers spend more time playing video games than they do anything else, including watching TV, doing homework or, or committing crimes. Um, and once these people age, they're just going to want to watch more and more of this stuff. What about you, John? John? You, you watch people play games? You going to watch any? I do enjoy watching. I don't, it's, it's kind of funny. The jocks have the ASPN. Now the gamers have their own channel. So more power to them. Yeah, I actually got like to that, see Josh. highlights of Artosis winning the Hearthstone tournament at BlizzCon, and I had been in the I had been in the seats live. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, Comcast is going to sell movies for download and streaming, just like they were Vudu or the iTunes Store or anything else. Uh, this is an exclusive report from Reuters. Uh, it's so it's not an announcement. It's sources saying. But still, what do you think? The idea of the cable television company getting in and saying, hey, buy buy some TV shows from us and download them to your laptop. You can buy from us. We'd like your money still. Please. I mean, I mean, this is this is this is a scheme where you have, uh, you know, the same people who are are pushing ultraviolet. You know, this is it, it just would make sense. That it's like, hey, we got this scheme where anyone could sell it. You want to be a seller? And they're like, sure, we'll put up a lemonade stand. Yeah, you know, this doesn't say if it's ultraviolet. Now. I think that would make the difference. Yeah, I would imagine that have to be it. Do you, uh, uh, what about you, John? Would you buy something through your set top cable box, or you just buy everything online? I just I would buy it every, online. I mean, we've got enough. We've got enough uh, options already with Amazon and Netflix. You don't need another one. It's, Comcast it's too says, late, buy too it online from us. You can sure. go to Comcast.com, <laughs> probably Xfinity.com or something. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I would not be a fan of that. Uh, okay, so uh, I think I'm reading these out of order because I clicked on the wrong thing. Sorry for the switcheroo here, but. More than a third of all YouTube viewing comes from long-form content. 
move over cat videos. Basically, YouTube was based on the idea that, you know, keep your videos under 10 minutes. Keep it short, silly. Uh, and everyone watching cat videos. New study says that over a third of all the time spent on YouTube is watching long form content. Uh, is this something huge for people who are making cinema masterpieces? Or is this just an artifact of you have longer programs? Of course, people are going to spend longer amounts of time watching them. What do you say, John? Well, as a person that does make, quote, long form, and it's long form in that we do 12-minute, 20-minute videos, it's very important. Um, most of the stuff that I watch on YouTube is in the form of long form. It's just that you're not going to be able to get that kind of content elsewhere. It, that's stuff that's more driven by, you know, by particular time uh, time slots. But, yeah, long form, I think there's a big market in YouTube for that. People want that kind of content. Agreed. Everybody's looking for a good over-the-air DVR if they want to cut the cord. Uh, Simple TV was a promising product. It's still not quite there. Check out Tablo, T-A-B-L-O. Uh, this one does require you in the base model to put in your own hard drive, uh, but it streams anywhere on the internet or over your home network. In fact, you don't even have to have an internet connection. You can still watch things on your phone, on your tablet. Uh, it's $149 for the base model. It's over $200 if you want to get the one that has a hard drive built in. Uh, and according to the folks at Engadget, it works really, really well. So I uh, I bought, for the first time since cutting the cable, I I bought an, an over-the-air antenna. I'm going to actually hook it up uh, so I can get those, you know, seven, eight stations. And you know what convinced me to do it was what happens if there's some kind of disaster that takes down the communication grid and you need something to turn on to find out what the news is locally. And it was from an email. Somebody scared me into it today and I bought that. Intel is reportedly in talks to sell web TV service. Is that news to you, Tom? Uh, well, this is news from last week. We mentioned that Verizon was rumored to be wanting uh -huh. to buy this. It's not Verizon. It's with Liberty Global, a European... Um, uh, what? A, 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 yeah, a European uh, cable company. And uh, so you may have a bidding war here, if it's true, which makes me wonder... Is what are the? Is there an offside, out of nowhere chance that maybe just maybe Intel wanted to build this to sell it, and they thought that the best way to put it on the market was to announce they were going to shake everything up and then say anyone want to buy this? Uh maybe I don't know. Usually, announcing I'm going to make shake something up doesn't raise the value on things. So I don't know. Well, especially when you fail to shake things up. <laughs> I think it's you Brian Kurzanich, CEO Brian Kurzanich coming in saying, uh, that's not going to work. Let's get rid of it. Let's figure out how to get rid of it without losing too much money on it. That's my guess. And that, my friends, is the end of Scan Lines. Oh, you stopped before. Was it ready? Was it oh, ready? For I, thought, I thought he was going to do the which, which, which Scan Lines. Oh, yeah. Like we the, don't do that one anymore. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh. I thought I thought you were forfeiting the end of that. I got buzzer. Oh. No, I was trying to lead up right to the big moment of the... And you just It's like this. I'm just... Here, you want me to... What? Here, I'm just going to go do Inception me. button. I left you. And then I'm going to... It's okay. I'm going to press the Inception button. Go ahead and do And this, it goes please. like... Here we go. Thank you. Oh, there. Oh, there. Much there. better. Guam. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Let's check in on the winner movie. Hey, uh, we didn't have any movies in the movie draft out last week because of some schedule changes, but uh, Thor kept making money. So Father Robert's like, he's got like half of what Casey has right now. He's in a distant, distant second place. This is brutal. I've never been more emotionally disengaged from a movie draft than this year. Like, I feel terrible. Look at me, dead last, rocking my $59 million after carrying 12 years of slave. Uh, I, there's no way. I, 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 Casey might just run away with it. I mean, what's left? What What are the surprise? Oh, we got we got The Hobbit. Jeff has a decent chance with that. And of yeah, course, uh, my money's on- Hunger Games for Justin. It's not going to be any slouch. You know, John, uh, do you understand what we're doing here with this with this movie draft idea? Not not entirely. No, so we're, we're playing I'll, fantasy football with movies. We at the end mm -hmm. of, at the beginning of each season, we we have an auction for for the you know we build our own slate and then we see which ones make the most uh, actual money. Uh, and in this case, um, Tom, for example, <laughs> when Ender's Game was put on the slate, got the jump oh, that's on all not of this the by best shouting. Example. Thanks a lot. $30. <laughs> it's 
Sorry. Because but in this case, it was an auction. It was an auction usually, unless an idiot bids $30 out of the gate on a stupid <laughs> movie that nobody wants. But normally yes. it's an auction and people try to bid people up and, and, and you have $100 limited to spend and then you get points for every dollar of domestic gross. Okay. So in this case, uh, we've got the big news is coming up around the corner. Wow, not a lot of money for the book thief, huh? That didn't work out so well for, for Jeff. Uh, $564,000. The Hunger Games Catching Fire. The last Hunger Games did $400 million. If this one does the way a lot of sequels do and runs away with even more. Now, granted, the first Hunger, Hunger Games was a summer release. This is a winter release. We'll find out if those are comparable. But Justin spent the record the highest price any movie's ever gone for in all of the drafts history, $74, two th or three quarters of his entire budget for it. And to be honest, he's sitting on $89 million from Bad Grandpa. I think there's every possibility that those two alone will put him in a very strong first place. And depending on what Out of the Furnace does, uh, it, it could be even better. Let's talk a little bit about what we're watching. watching so john uh, we'll give you a little a moment to kind of maybe think about this if you haven't prepared All yet right. but did we just talk about television shows movies web videos anything that we've been watching uh recently and we uh we start with brian who did some walking dead catching up i know that'll make sense i did all of the walking dead catch up until uh last night's episode i was all the way fully caught up until i saw the big tease at the end of last week's episode and then I just suddenly wasn't interested in watching. I was going to, all of a sudden I was back to garden, uh, guarded. I was like, I'm going to let you guys. But I do want to talk about it. I do want to talk about all the things that I really, really liked uh, about this last season of The Walking Dead. We'll do a spoiler zone. Uh, I also went ahead and bought, because it's not on Netflix, season four of Archer. And now I get what you were talking about, about the Bob's Burgers reference. And that my friend, was extraordinary. It was so good. I watched Wasn't it and it I ran into the other room and I pulled Bonnie into the room and I'm like, Bonnie, Bonnie, you gotta watch this. You gotta watch this. It was amazing. Uh, I also watched, do you remember we did a story on an upcoming movie called The Europa Report? Yes, uh, and I stumbled across it this weekend. I started watching it and then I, I got interrupted and I had to go and I haven't finished it. I only got like two minutes into it on Netflix. Uh, I really enjoyed the experience. Now, understand, uh, yeah, it, it is a lower budget fare, you know. So, so the the, the acting's not going to blow your brains out. The special effects aren't aren't going to drive you nuts or whatever. Uh, and and the pacing gets a little slow at times. However, if you look at it not as uh, as as a traditional piece of science fiction cinema, but instead a highly realistic blueprint for how a, a mission to Europa might actually work. And they mix in actual news footage. They make it as a as as kind of a mockumentary. They started off with the fact that 89 days into the mission, their communications uh, systems goes out. So people back on Earth have to just sit and hope the mission's going okay. And uh, you don't know, well, if they lost communications, how did we get this information? How are we seeing this footage? Uh, in that regard, and especially as somebody who has spent so many literal hours arguing with the likes of Andrew Main and Justin Robert Young on the Weird Things podcast about the likelihood of life on Europa and what would it look like and when how could we go there and what would it take to confirm it and what would happen. Uh, I found this deeply, deeply intellectually satisfying. I really loved it. I think I might watch it again because the way it wrapped up, like, I, I mean, I just, got, I just got goosebumps thinking about the way it wrapped up. And this is all from, from what otherwise looks like on the surface, like a, a, a rather... You know, a budget fair science fiction project it has very big ideas and it gives a lot of respect to the reality of space travel. And there's still things you got to kind of forgive. The best thing I watched all week uh, was the online only mini sode, they're calling it. A webisode would be another thing. Six minutes and 50 seconds or so of Doctor Who. Uh, and little bit, little minor spoiler if you haven't seen it, but come on, if you're that big of a Doctor Who fan, you've seen it. It's called The Night of the Doctor. And this is in advance of the 50th anniversary episode that's coming up this Saturday called The Day of the Doctor. The Night of the Doctor features the eighth Doctor, Paul McGann, who was only ever in the made-for-TV movie of Doctor Who. Uh, he's done a lot of audio. He's done a lot of other things in the Doctor Who universe, but he only got to be on television one time. We never saw him regenerate into the next Doctor in this episode. He shows up. It's written by Stephen Moffat. He's the doctor, and you get to see him regenerate at the very end of it. 
they packed in 30 minutes worth of plot in this six minutes. Paul McGann kills it as the doctor. Uh, they've got some nice stuff for old fans of the Tom Baker generation in there. And it just really got me excited to watch this 50th anniversary special, which is going to be, what, I think 70 minutes of stuff. And if they can pack that much into this six minutes, this this one should blow your mind. I think. Where, where can I where can I see it? Because I've sort of I sort of I got distracted. I saw a shiny object and, and canceled cable. So I haven't been watching Doctor Who. Oh, this is not on television. You would not find it on television. If you have, have television, it's not going to do you any good. You go to youtube.com slash BBC. That's probably the easiest way to find it, uh, I think. Or maybe BBC America. But it's on the BBC website. It's on the BBC America website. And it's on the BBC YouTube channel. Awesome. Uh, I'm also making myself watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. for you people. So I can tell you if it ever changes. It hasn't changed. And I watched wait, Alpha wait. House today. A Agents of Shield, real quick. Uh, you're more or less confident in the upcoming four seas or four uh, series on Netflix. Like, like, uh, do you feel like is is Agents of Shield making you think like I don't know about the Marvel universe and television? Oh uh, no, I have I do not connect those two in my mind. Actually, okay. I I oh, think okay. I think oh that's Netflix. They won't have any of the same issues to deal with that ABC makes Agents of Shield deal with. Uh, and it's oh, also different point. producers, different directors. Like, to me, that's just like an entirely different thing. So, yeah, I haven't put those two together. If anything, it makes me more hopeful for the Netflix series because I'm like, oh, well, they won't have to worry about putting it on primetime television. So maybe right. they'll do it. They won't make that mistake. Sure. But what I want to talk about was Alpha House with John Goodman. I finally watched the pilot episode, which has been around for a long time, I realize. Uh, but I fired it up this afternoon because the first three episodes are now live. They're promoting it all over Amazon Prime. It's written by Gary Trudeau, and it just feels dated. John Goodman's great in it. There's an amazing cameo by Bill Murray at the beginning of it. It's well-produced. It's well-shot. Uh, the acting's fantastic. It really feels a lot like Veep from HBO. Sure. But I, 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 just, I just feel like it's a little dated in its, in its stance and its jokes, maybe. Uh, chat room is saying uh, Trudeau's a bit dated too. Doonesbury, yeah. uh, I remember surprising. my parents reading that in the eighties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so John, uh, any, anything you want to mention that you've been watching lately? Uh, I've been I mean, doing the kind of the lessons that I do. It's it takes a lot of work and a lot of research. I don't get to watch that much, but I do watch a lot of YouTube videos, and I do want to like mention the PBS Idea Channel is one of my favorite uh, channels. Uh, he does a great rundown on. He picks a topic and. And it just run, does a great rundown on it. It looks at it both from a philosophical point and from an entertainment point. It's a really great show. Another show that I kind of watch as I kind of as I wind down at the end of the night is actually a show called QI from England. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. Stephen Fry hosts it's like a panel comedy show, but they just I have just, heard this mentioned. Have you heard that? It's it's just a great show. You find them. I'm not sure. They're, it's not an official channel on on YouTube, but there are full episodes on there. You can watch. They're just it's just factoid after factoid. And they just do it in a, in a funny, irrelevant, irrelevant way. It is kind of a year. Holy cow! Uh, the chat room British is way. exploding. Oh, they good. are freaking out right with uh, with They're recognition. Like They're all giving you high fives yeah, on QI. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to give that a try. It's definitely worth. It. They've been going for at least, at least at least ten years now. They're they're every every series is a new another letter in the alphabet. So right now they're on series K, and uh, it's great. Yeah, check it out. Yeah, K episode right one on. is called Knees and Knockers because the <laughs> names begin with K. I'm going to check, check that out, too. I, I've heard people kind of in the periphery of my Twitter feed, maybe, like having private conversations that I didn't understand. So thank you for clearing that up. Now I, I know what they're – they're not talking about the wireless protocol, Chi. It's, it's <laughs> <Yes>. totally different. <laughs> shall goodness. we do some well, feedback, Brian? Now it's time uh, yes, we shall. for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Radio. Yeah. Tom, we have yes. a report from the mole – on the inside, who wants to give us the real scoop on something we're mistaken about? This one says, uh, hi, Brian and Tom, about the difficulty in providing TV to Internet-only customers. As you know, uh, side note, we've had a number of people who have tried to cancel cable, but they're like, look, we'll, we'll lower your Internet. Just please keep cable, all right? That's Just just take these 20 channels for free, and we'll cut off it to where it's actually cheaper to, to get Internet with cable than without it uh, permanently. He says, uh, I currently work for a cable company in Canada. 
uh, and used to work as an installer for AT&T Broadband in Seattle way back when. There's a little more to adding TV to internet-only customers than flipping a bit on the computer, even just the basic 20 channels. To provide internet to customers without TV, a filter must be installed to block all the frequencies except those used by the DOCSIS uh, cable. Uh, which means that there's even more of a cost to the MSOs to add those channels because an installer has to go out and remove the filter and in many cases install a digital cable box because most systems are going to go digital only. Why would they do this then? It's not to bury the story about cord cutters, of which I sort of, sort of am one, but rather to look better on the investor sheets. Those investors don't really care about the number of cord cutters, but rather it's all about the balance sheet. Does this year's number look Better or the same than last year's? Yes equals no. Anyway, basically his point is that uh, it's it's a matter of profits. It's 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 all about the bottom line, and I would imagine it's about the expense of sending one out, sending someone out to intentionally block your your cable. And he wraps up by saying the number of TV subscribers is the most important figure for an MSO because that's the benchmark that the cable industry has had since the pre-internet phone world of the cable co's and it's a legacy that will take a fundamental shift in the industry for them not to care about anymore probably requiring a new generation of management to take over which which i believe was kind of our point when we talked about that right tom yeah i feel like we that's what we've been saying is like they don't the reason they're giving you these screaming deals or making you keep the the the, the cable channels is they want to have that subscriber number look better uh and look better to investors so tim's totally right on that we're on the same page it's interesting about the filter thing Another reason they might want to talk you into keeping cable, especially considering it helps their bottom line numbers look better to investors, is that more people are probably do not have the filter, right? Because they had right. cable. Most people got cable and internet, or if they didn't get internet, they had cable first. I, I would feel like that would be the more frequent situation. And if somebody's like, nope, I don't want to have television, they're like, well, we don't want to roll a truck to go put a filter on to stop him from getting the 20 channels. So let's just throw him in. And that way yeah. well, that well, let's, helps and our like, subscriber let's say, numbers let's say and we costs, don't have to bother putting a filter right. on. Let's, let's, let's say it's 70 bucks to send a guy out and spend an hour doing that crap. I mean, if uh, think about how much you could discount 80, his $80 internet. So you, you could discount it $5 a month and give them them free. And then it's going to take like a year. Uh, I guess that's how much time you have to try to get them back or especially if yeah. you do like six month deal or whatever, then it's way cheaper because you don't have to do anything. Yeah, totally. No, but thanks for that, Tim. That's great insight. I uh, love that. Uh, I've got an email from Jason who says, I avoided hearing blurred lines at every turn all summer. And now every week I'm subjected to it and it turns into a horrible, horrible earworm. If I was any good at the whole creative video bumper thing, I'd send you one, but I'm not. So I'm hoping one of the awesome Twit Army members will save me from insanity and come up with a new and better scan lines bumper. Please. Love the show, Jason. <laughs> uh, we do have the other one, don't we? We have another one. So we no, just the, the other one is just the other one is just goes which which is scan lines. That's all. That's all it does. We might have to. Which, we just might have to switch back to that one for a while. Maybe, yeah, maybe just for a little bit. But really, uh, all right, help Jason out. Send this last one, Tom, was a response to our discussion about the Google Plus uh, comment system on YouTube. And uh, it, 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 if you don't mind, like I have opinions on it. Can we do like a back and forth? Like maybe you can read and I can respond to each of these these points that he brings up. Yeah, sure. Here we go. Uh, dear Brian and Tom, as a longtime viewer, I was shocked. At least it's kind of shocked. I was kind of shocked, kind of shocked that you both kind of <laughs> poo-pooed the outrage over the changes over at YouTube. I'll admit at first, even I was kind of like that, whatever about the change. But a friend who does YouTube content explained his problem with the change to me. His channel is Boogie2988. Basically, there are two big issues that Google needed to address when it comes to the integration of G Plus and YouTube, in his opinion. First is the fact that the previous comment system had a hard limit of characters you could use in a comment. I can't recall the number off the top of my head, but it was enough to have about a single paragraph. Now there is no limit. So instead of posting actual comments, good or bad, people are now posting whole blocks of text. One I saw yesterday was the entire Constitution and ASCII art of random genitalia. All right. First of all, good. That's that's in, you're listing this as a bad thing. What's so great at only being able to type one paragraph if you want to have an especially on YouTube, which is the video version of the marketplace of ideas where you want to have a free exchange. The problem civility very has very rarely has a problem with more words, uh, an interaction that develops into something precious and special. Very, very rarely has a problem with more words. Second of all, 
the fact that you can make SKR genitalia is freaking rad because you're not going to be able to see the whole thing. That's the other thing is you have to actively click. You have to read the first few lines of the paragraph and say, oh, I like what he's saying. Let me see more and click in order to read the rest of it. If somebody if you click and it's like it's the Constitution, you're going to like, I don't care. And you're not going to read it. But uh, but what blows my mind is the way people are protesting the new YouTube comment system is to take advantage of the increased flexibility of the YouTube comment system. People are saying, hey, watch this video that I can now link to that I couldn't link to before to see why the new YouTube content system is bad or comment system is bad. Or they're like, hi, here's a picture of a tank and a guy. We're making an army. By the way, we couldn't have done this before on YouTube, but I'm glad we can now. It is all of this. It's, it's like these are all great things. All right. What else does he say? Sean goes on to say, well, another thing that you mentioned was the fact that while, yes, there is a lot of troll, mean-spirited, idiotic posts on YouTube with the previous system, they would eventually just get buried. With the new system, the people who post those nasty and even vile posts about how Boogie should go kill himself or how about you eat yourself to death get brought to the top of the comment system because of the actual fans who tell jerks like this off. Uh, oh, now, that's interesting because I would say that's, that is not new on, on this. First of all, they'll figure that out very quickly. And if your fans are fans, they'll understand that by responding, they're accidentally bringing up to the top. And that will sell, sort itself out immediately. That's a matter of educating the populace. But I guarantee you, there was nothing civil about the program before. Every single scam school video, comment number one, retarded hair. Comment number two, click here to skip the ads. And without fail, that under this, people, you can actually have a dialogue and get something done. So there's, again, that's nothing to do with the format. You're, you're confusing form and content on that. And then he goes on to say, well, yes, you can block a user, but the blocking system only blocks that one account, not the 20 accounts that the person made with the same name. And he talks about how people like PewDiePie and a bunch of others are telling people to do comments elsewhere off of YouTube because they're so upset about the change. So, look, here's the thing. Yes, it is. A, 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 you used to be able to anonymously very easily get in and, and just drop a hate bomb and leave. And I'm sure that felt really good for the people who are doing it. Unfortunately, it made a caustic, useless environment that limited the free exchange of ideas and damaged the brand of YouTube. There is a reason that I constantly compare the YouTube comments to paper cuts. Uh, yes, it's new that that the YouTube, the, the Google Plus system, and it'll take some education. But the mere fact that people are using all the awesome new tools to protest, it tells me. This is going to be gone in six months. Everyone's going to be like, because I guarantee you right now, if they flipped it back, you'd have nothing but complaints. They're like, oh, well, wait, I, I liked being able to link to stuff. Uh, well, that was fun making Ask we, we can't do that anymore. I'm not worried about it. It'll be just fine. Couldn't disagree with you more, sir. And John, I'm interested in your perspective on this real quickly before we say goodbye, because you use Vimeo, right? Well, you actually, we, we've also put them on YouTube as well. And we, we have noticed the exact same thing that Brian has just mentioned. Yeah, YouTube is used to be a wasteland of comments. I mean, just, I've gotten some, the nastiest things said to me were on YouTube. But, uh, since the change, it's actually, I think it's gotten better. People are just against change. Every time Facebook rolls out something different, people are up in arms and complaining. So what's new with YouTube comments? So. I, uh, I like this comment. Comments are broken regardless, but persistent real identities are not a solution. Do you want your pro-life boss reading your pro-choice comments? This is made in a Google Plus comment on our YouTube video of last week's frame rate by someone whose name, according to Google Plus, is Woo Wee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, QED, oh, my man. friend. You just <laughs> saved it. Look. Look, there will be, I, here's the thing, the, as more places go to cover their butts and reduce a caustic environment, other places embrace it. Uh, the, the If what you want to do is be hateful in a free-for-all, there's 4chan, there's slash B slash, and there's there's all these places where you could go and do that. But you, but YouTube has, uh, it wants to be legitimate. It, it is the network distribution of our generation. It is the dominant force. It and Vimeo are changing the world and I think it's incumbent on them to create an environment where uh, where it's it, where they reach the maximum number of people. And they certainly can't do that with the system that they had in place. Uh, really, honestly, what's going on here is they called the commenting system Google+. There would be complaints and there would be upset people if they changed the comment system at all because they've changed the comment system before and people got upset. But what's causing this to go internet crazy is the fact that it's called Google+. And whenever you go to the internet, I said this on Tech News Today, and you tell the internet you have to sign up for this thing and you don't have a choice if you want to comment, 
the internet goes nuts. They're like, don't make me do anything I don't want to do. I don't want to sign up for some service. If it was called YouTube Plus Comments and it just happened to also be Google Plus, you wouldn't see this level of reaction. It's it's just it's just they didn't go about it the right way. They they offended yeah, plus, the internet by making them think they were forcing them to sign up for this other thing, even though it's all the same company. I think a lot of people don't realize they're all the same company. All you have to do is make a second account, make your troll account, and then it literally is is two clicks in the well, upper right corner. Right? It's See, just, people could just go says, make troll accounts. See, you can come up with a you can come up with an objection to every single thing that you would suggest. It's just a feeling. That's that's my point. It doesn't matter what the yep. logic of the situation is. People are just yeah. offended because they said you now have to go sign up for this thing that's not called YouTube. Yeah, you heard Tom. Now shut up, crybabies. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not what I'm saying at all. I, I no, think it's well, that's what I heard. Human <laughs> John Hess, managing uh, editor, filmmakeriq.com. Thank you for suffering through our Google Plus rant today. Uh, I enjoyed and for it. being on the show. It's great having you, man. Thank you, guys. That was really, really great. Let folks know what's going on over there at oh. uh, Filmmaker IQ. We talked about it a little off the top of the show, but uh, you got anything in particular coming up you want to tell folks about? Well, we just released today the uh, science and history of popcorn, how the snack I saved the that. movies. It's awesome. It literally saved the movies. So check that one out. And uh, we're, we're working on some more stuff coming your way. And we post articles about everything we can find on filmmaking and kind of relate to side things about filmmaking and we can every single day. So check us out, filmmakeriq.com. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash fr. We stream live every Monday, uh, usually around 3.30 Pacific, 6.30 Eastern time. Uh, it all depends on how the schedule goes before us. You can email us. Our email address is framerate at twit.tv. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and tell us why we're wrong about Google Plus comments by using Google Plus comments at uh, youtube.com slash twit framerate. Brian, well yeah. done. Good show. See you next time. You're on now, Nemedia is fine. You can be anonymous. Just make another account. All right, everybody, stand by. Spoiler zone, real quick. Silent breed is people! Oh! Yes, Tom, the let me tell you all the things. zone is here, ladies and gentlemen. Brian Brushwood has finally watched some of The Walking Dead, Brian. Yeah, let me tell you all the things that I really, really loved about this season. And I'm going to try to go in order because it may get a little bit jumbled. Uh, once again, I loved the fact that it brought that it just came in in the middle of, of, of a big gap. And I have no idea how last season ended up. Uh, but I noticed that uh, that there was a brief moment where things were happy. And I think that's what you were talking about when you said that's what's great about uh, or that's what was so great about the comic was that yeah. it would it would make you feel safe. You're like, this is it. We're going to see the building of something new. And you're like, oh, crap, that's a whole thing that I hadn't even considered might be a problem in this world. And um, I was way off base with a description tag saying like a new threat coming at them. And like I was convinced it was cannibalism because that was a big theme in um, in the comic books. At one point, there was an arc that dealt with people who were cannibals. And in fact, um I guess this is a spoiler for the comic book. Can I say yeah, the, the little sure. trivia fact for people? Yeah, I won't. Anyway, some, somebody dies of cannibalism. <laughs> About the arc of the show. Well, no, 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 no. Wait, are you running off, Jason? Is that Jason running off? Jason ran off. Sorry, I uh, didn't realize my mic was live. I was turning you down because I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> Oh, no, no. I was talking about what didn't happen in the show, but it was a thing in the comics. They, oh, okay. they, they, right. they did a, like a one-off side thing with, with some candles. I w I, Apologies. Uh, okay, it, if you just want to be like, screw you people, it's not a spoiler, go ahead. But if but you're going to get people complain if you spoil something from the comics. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Well, okay. There's zombies in the comics. There, I said it. Uh, but but I thought that was a great idea to... to uh, I liked the, the contagion infection story. I thought that was a good story. I thought the double problem of... of needing medicine and uh, the fact that somebody the moment somebody dies you know they become a a, a lethal threat and that they don't have the ability to fight it off I, th I thought uh i i really liked all of that um the uh, i i also liked some people are like i don't like the way the character Ch uh, carol changed and just suddenly went dark uh i think she had a really interesting arc that was smooth and made sense I think yeah, it's a logical she didn't seem conclusion dark to me at all. Did she seem dark? It just seemed to she seemed, like she seemed practical. That's Carol's eternal large logic, right? She's not turned evil. Yeah. No, she she became practical. She has fully adapted to this new world, and yeah. in this case, 
she made uh, a, a very sensible decision. Here's two people who are definitely going to die. They're definitely going to infect the rest of everything else. This, if I, if I suggest this, it's going to be a giant brouhaha. Nothing's going to happen, and then we're all going to die. I'm just going to take care of it. I'm just going to take care of it. And they and, built, uh, they built you to that decision point by having her teaching the kids with the knives. Because that's the first time you see like, ooh, Carol's breaking the rules because she thinks that it serves a good end and she just right. doesn't want people to know about it. And and so what she does with the two sick people is just that same logic being applied in a much more important and larger situation. And what's great is that they brought it together. So like when you see it, it looks like a horrific, malevolent uh, thing. Now, you wait, did they ever answer who was flinging mice at the uh, at at the walls. Was a, that was a little girl. girl too. No, it was oh, a little girl. That's right. Because she, she thinks okay. that she li she likes the zombies. She feels bad for them and she wants to make friends with them. I see. Okay. Yeah, all right. Uh that's creepy. Uh I, I, I don't know why I never saw that moment or 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 caught it. Maybe I I was doing taxes. Uh but but at, at any rate, I love the fact that they showed her actions first under the horrific guise of a madman serial killer on the inside. But by the time you get to that moment where, where he asks her flat out, like, did you kill those guys? She's like, yeah. And then yeah. it's like, like that was, that was transformative for me because I was just like, makes sense. I don't think this is going to go well. <laughs> you know, uh, I liked all of that. In fact, um, you know, th there were some parts that uh, were a little over the top and 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 kind of heavy handed. I got to tell you, man, I'm 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 just cold on all the the, the double gore on everything. It's like to me, oh, really? the the spot the the spot, and I understand you have to have it because that's the I world. I was happy, about and there it, were personally. there were there were some good jumps or whatever, but but that's not what I care about. That's um the gore porn never did it for me. Uh, it's the intellectual, it's the agonizing choice porn that I love. It's just like I'm like, oh, what you gonna do? Uh, but I'll tell you what, man, I just went dead cold when I saw the teaser, the end of the last week's episode, and I saw, I saw, I saw the governor, and I was just like, I'm going to let Tom tell me whether or not I want to watch this. Here's the thing. Okay, the very last episode that you watched, I felt like started to sag a little. I was like, uh, eh, this wasn't as good as the promise of the early ones. And I, I, I wasn't regretting telling you to catch up or telling you to watch, but <clears throat> part of me was like, well, hopefully it gets better after this. And then, of course, we see the teaser saying, like, it's the governor next week. And I'm like, oh, boy. I yeah. watched the governor episode this week. I'm not going to tell you anything about the episode, but I will tell you my emotions during the episode. 20 minutes into that episode, I'm thinking, holy crap, they may have done it. This may be one of the better episodes of the season so far, and this has been a great season. I can't wait to tell Brian about this. 40 minutes into the episode, I feel like... <laughs> Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure where we're going with this now. This is not the turn I expected to make. It feels like a wrong turn, but I bet that's, I'm supposed to feel that. I'm supposed to, supposed to be doubting it right now, and there's going to be something happen pretty soon that's just going to wake me up and realize, okay, this is what's going on. The end of the episode, I was like, that, that was it? That was the thing? Yeah, don't watch this episode. <laughs> So should should I just skip this episode? Maybe maybe hop back in next week. I I would wait. It essentially it feels like except for that first twenty minutes, which I thought was great. Uh, some people disagree. I, I've read different versions on the internet. I thought the first twenty minutes you could just watch the first twenty minutes and then stop. Like as soon as you get tired, just stop. Because I thought maybe there's a really good governor character study going on there, where I'm like, oh yeah, this is this is more like what would happen. This is believable. Well, yeah, well, this is weird, so, so right? Tell me this, like, uh, and again, I'm, I'm going to use that phrase, and I hate that we're doing it for, especially for a show that's trying to break away from the comic. But, but in the comics, part of what was seductive about the governor was that he was cold and practical, and he did what needed to be done, and he brought order. He was also the cruelest individual you had ever seen, and that is not what they chose to do in the show. They did a soft politician who made wishy-washy choices and gets weirder and badder as it went on, and I didn't like that at all. Um, if I just tuned in, if let's say I skipped last generation entirely. And and all of a sudden, this is the first time I'm seeing the governor. Would it be like the governor that I liked from the comic books? No. No? Right. No. Well, then, but th that, what that first 20 minutes was to me is if we've got that wishy-washy guy who did all this stuff and it doesn't really make sense, this is actually what I would expect and would want him to be like at this point. And this all kind this of is much more interesting and this all makes sense. Then he starts to become the, uh, the governor from before again. And I'm like, oh, and now we're back to this guy which I, you know, I guess <laughs> feel the same, right? And so what I feel like is they took one episode and stretched it into two. 
uh, so that they could give us that bigger character study. And the second, this episode next week is going to tell me for sure whether it's worth skipping or whether you should kind of just like, well, just plow right, through well, the just, end of it. It's not, you know, you'll get, it'll get better quick. Just keep me posted on it. It's just, yeah. and, and by the way, it's kind of awesome having no idea how last season ended up. Although it, at one point, I think it was the third episode in, I just looked up and I'm like, hey, I don't see Andrea around anymore. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I wonder, huh, all right, whatever. Yeah, she gone, <laughs> like, dude. I, she I, gone. I think that's part of what I love, loved about it. Yeah, uh, that, that's, yeah, that's and, no, uh, no small how about, part of it, I suppose. How about the decision to exile Carol making a lot of sense because it straddles the ground and it's like, well, it's fair to Carol. It says he understands where he's come, where she, where she's coming from, but can't have it. Tyrese is obviously going to freak the hell out and kill her if, if he finds out and he's there. Uh, so Rick's going to take a lot of heat from Tyrese, but this seems fair. This seems fair. And then, and then Daryl gets back and I was like, Oh, this going to be good. And uh, like, it's like, do they, do they explore any of that discussion in this? Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll watch it. I'll yeah. Yeah. I'll just, watch just, it. All right. Just let me know what you think. But I, I'm glad that you you saw what I saw in those first few episodes where it's like, oh, yeah, this is a different feel. This is this is feeling like The Walking Dead. This is this has got choices and differences and and people who are not just clearly crazy or evil or good. You know, they're nuanced like Carol. That is brilliant what they did with her uh, this yeah. season. I absolutely loved it. Yeah, loved it uh, in that regard. Um, right Maybe on. I guess that's it for a spoiler zone. Uh, <laughs> that is it for Spoiler Zone. Uh, oh. Thank you, folks, for watching. Hang on, one one quick thing. Um, do you want to? Have, have we? We need to have another The Wire experience thing, right? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you you I guess you started watching The Shield, but you didn't I really. One I, I assume you The Shield. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that. So that obviously that's not taken. Uh, man, I listen to the Harmontown podcast every single week. I'm going through the back catalog. I got like five more episodes of the Harmontown Dan Harmon's podcast left to go. I've only watched like half of one episode of Community. Have you watched Community at all? I have watched it on and off. I haven't caught every episode every week because it's, it doesn't really have so much of a story arc. I've watched a yeah. ton of it, though. I love it. Do, do, you want to, well, do, you want, do you want to try plowing through them all together? I mean, it's, it's good stuff. Oh, we'd have I, I wouldn't mind rewatching them. Or Hulu Plus. It's a different kind of, of catching up, though, right? It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Just something to talk it's not about. A, it's um, not a long, long serial story. Dude, I, I just I, I love the I love the idea of doing the spoiler zone as, as like a book club, and I want to find something that we can all dive into and talk about. I could do the it. shield. It, it just uh, it, it we we kind of got uh, sidetracked there for a couple of weeks. Uh, but right, well, I, if you, I would if be you, willing to commit to you the shield. You tell me later on what you want to do, but uh, but regardless, I'm, say, I think I'm saying soon. the shield. If you want to still do it, yes. Oh yes, very much so. I'm, right, I'm totally do down for it. Especially because everyone who has Amazon Prime has it free and they can play along at home. So, all right, that's that's an official commitment on The Shield. I will assign myself to watch at least one episode of The Shield by next week. Done. Awesome. All right, done and done. Well, hey, man, I love all you guys. I got to run, but we are doing... Yes, I got to run things. too. I'm way late, actually. Uh, we, we are doing a Weird Things podcast tonight. Uh, I'm going to find out what time, and we'll, of course, make sure to tweet that out. Um, and uh, it'll be good. My guess is I'll have a chance to... Oh man, I probably can't talk a bit about. Um, uh, all right, uh, man, I can't talk about the Europa, Europa report. I want, I want you to watch it. In fact, if you want to do a spoiler zone on that next week, we can do that too. Do actually, because I started it, I just need to finish it. So I've been meaning to. All right, cool. Yeah, I'd love to talk see about you guys specifics later. on it. All right, see you guys. Bye -bye.